Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, to do for joining today's call. We're going to give it just one minute to allow for others to join before we begin. Good afternoon and thank you all again for joining today's joint call on the national state of homelessness with the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I'm Jim Butler, Vice President of External Affairs with the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I'm joined by Tom Murphy, Senior Director of Communications with the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and Nancy Flores, Media Relations Manager with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and they're going to help facilitate today's call. So on the call today, we're going to be audio only, and the call is going to be recorded. Following today's speakers, we're going to address questions that are submitted in the Q&A box. And if we run over on time and you still have a question or would like to schedule an interview with one of our speakers, please send an email directly to me, Tom, or Nancy. So today's call comes ahead of the release of HUD's annual homeless assessment report, AR2, that will provide nationwide estimates for homelessness. Our speakers are going to provide insight on how to analyze the latest figures and outline the steps needed to address housing insecurity. Our speakers are also going to cover how federal disinvestment in housing programs, rising housing costs, the severe shortage of affordable homes, and the end of many pandemic era assistance programs has resulted in an increase in homelessness. So I'll now turn it over to Tom, who will introduce our speakers. Following the speakers, Nancy will begin taking questions submitted in the Q&A box, and all of those questions will be answered once all of our speakers have concluded. Tom? Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first up, we'll hear from Steve Berg. Steve is the Chief Policy Officer for the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Steve will provide uh, an overview of where we're seeing increases in homelessness. Uh, an account for how local providers are ending homelessness for people in their communities, but struggling against the tide of inflow of newly homeless people entering the system and other challenges faced by shelter and service providers. And then uh, also touch upon uh, the uh, new trend of local leaders and state leaders returning to criminalization tactics uh, towards unhoused people. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Diane Yentel. She is the president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, Diane will provide an overview of the worsening affordable housing crisis and the shortage of homes for extremely low income renter households, uh, how pandemic resources uh, effectively reduced housing instability, uh, and yet um, the dangers now that the housing market has worsened and resources have either been depleted or expired at the same time that we're seeing uh, an increase in eviction filings. And finally, we will be joined by Peggy Bailey, the VP of Housing and Income Security for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities to provide an overview of the immediate needs and long-term solutions to address the homelessness crisis. And with that said, thank you very much for your time and I will be turning it over to Steve. All right, thank you, Tom, and thank you everybody who joined the call. Um, Thank you for your interest in this topic. Uh, first of all, let me talk about the, the overall trends in homelessness. The, the, uh, probably the most common, most well-known report or data collection on the number of homeless people is what's called the PID count, the point in time annual count. Um, that's not the account that HUD is on the verge of putting out. That, the, the pit count that was done in January of 2023 will usually comes out in November sometime, but I'll explain how they relate in just a second. But the, the what the pit count does is just HUD works with communities all over the country to get a count of how many people are 
living in shelters or living on the streets at one particular time in late January of each year. And because HUD has been doing that for 15 years now, over 15 years, since about 2007, what that allows people to do is see the long-term trend in the number of homeless people. And what that long-term trend shows is that from 2007 until about 2016, the number went down each year fairly substantially. And then starting in about 2016, it started going back up again. And we expect when the 2023 pit comes out um, in November, it'll show that it went up again uh, based on the numbers from early 2023. So there's two, two broad dynamics that go into that. And the, the, what's called the AHAR-2, the Annual Homeless Assessment Report 2, which is the data that will come out shortly, we think, um, is helpful in showing both of the dynamics that lead to these long-term trends. On the one hand, the one half of the dynamic is how many people are moving from homelessness into housing. This number over the course of all those years has gone up. People are moving from homelessness into housing faster and faster. Um, this is, has a lot to do with the hard work by homeless providers, homeless services providers all over the country. It's got to do with the hard work by HUD, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Veterans Affairs, and their partners at the Department of Health and Human Services, by the work that's done by the organizations on this call and many, many other national and local organizations. What they have done is help communities develop systemic coordinated approaches to find the people who are in the worst shape and move them from homelessness back into housing as quickly as possible. Um, so that's, that's one dynamic that goes into these long-term trends. The other dynamic um, is not such good news. Uh, that is the number of people who are housed but then lose their housing for whatever reason and fall into homelessness. Um, the numbers on this will you'll also and when the AHAR2 comes out shortly, you'll also be able to look at look at indicators that show that this is what's happening with this. And what's happening with this is that it's getting worse. The number of people losing their housing and becoming homeless uh, is get is getting is on a bad downward trend right now. Um, it's part of a long-term trend and due to short-term factors as well. There's, there's uh, really since people started keeping comprehensive data on these topics after World War II, so really for 75 years, the long-term trend has been the cost of modest rental housing has been going up faster than modest incomes, whether that's from low-wage jobs, or whether it's from disability benefits, which are definitely not kept up with the, with the cost of housing. So because of this, the number of people who lose their housing and become homeless has continued to go up. Um, the, the way these dynamics interplay with each other is simple. The, 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 if, if the number of people who lose their housing and become homeless goes up faster than the number of people who are homeless and move back into housing, then the overall point in time number will go up for that year. If, if people lose their housing, it goes up more than the people who got into housing, then the point in time number of homeless people goes up. And if people move from homelessness into housing faster, then lost their housing and become homeless, then the point in time number goes down. The uh, the long-term trend on housing and losing housing and housing becomes more exp expensive. I said the long-term trend is it's just gotten worse and worse. Now, of course, there's some years where it's a little better, some years it's a little worse. We went through a period 
of, for about three or four years leading up to the start of the pandemic and into the first year of the pandemic when things weren't getting worse quite as badly in the large housing issues. The, the, uh, the cost of housing wasn't going up quite so fast. Uh, people weren't losing their housing quite so much. Then, but starting in the last year or two, um, based on lots of anecdotal data that we've collected from around the country, uh, it's gotten quite a bit worse quite fast. And so that's what we, we expect that the HUD data is going to show the same thing on a more comprehensive basis. And that's why we expect it in November when the 29 number comes out for 2023, that's going to get worse. The other thing that's happening, as was mentioned, is a lot of communities are responding to this, responding to more homelessness by criminalization, which is exactly the wrong approach. Uh, communities move people from homelessness into housing faster when people work together in the communities and really work to help landlords accept homeless people into their housing, provide the funds that's necessary to do that. And when when communities are criminalizing, uh, that makes that problem even worse. Now to, to hear more about these housing issues, let me turn it over to National Loan from Housing Coalition President and CEO, Diane Yantel. Great, thanks so much, Steve. And hello and, and welcome. Thanks for everybody who is joining today. Appreciate your interest in this important topic. So even before the pandemic, millions of households with extremely low incomes struggled to remain housed, and more than half a million people experienced homelessness. Before the pandemic, we had a shortage of 7 million homes that are affordable and available to the lowest income people. So another way of saying that same number is for every 100 of the lowest income renters, there are fewer than 40 homes that are affordable and available to them. And the shortage ranges from most severe to least severe, but there is no state and there's virtually no community that has a sufficient number of homes for its lowest income people. And because of the shortage, 10 million of the lowest income households paid at least half of their very limited incomes on rent. So when you have such limited income to begin with and you pay so much of it on your rent, you're always one financial shock, whether a broken down car, a missed day of work, a sick child, an unexpected bill, away from missing rent, facing eviction, and in worst cases, becoming homeless. So this is why we have homelessness in our country. People who are homeless lack access to decent, affordable, accessible homes. And we have homelessness and housing poverty in our country really for two main reasons. One is a basic market failure. The private market on its own cannot build and operate apartments that are affordable to the lowest income people because what they can afford to pay in rent doesn't cover the costs. This is a basic market failure that requires government intervention, in this case, in the form of subsidies. But the second reason why we have homelessness is despite the clear and growing need, the federal government funds a system where only one in four households gets the housing assistance that they need. And we have essentially what is a housing lottery system where only the lucky 25% get the help that they need. So all of this was the case in 2019. And then of course came a global pandemic and housing needs worsened significantly due to lost jobs, lost hours at work, increased costs. Advocates sounded the alarm and federal, state, and local governments took heed and provided historic resources and protections to keep tenants housed, including the federal moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rent and the $46.5 billion in rental assistance, an unprecedented level of support for low-income renters. So, Today, at least 10 million emergency rental assistance payments have been made. And together with the eviction moratorium, ERA kept eviction filing rates during the pandemic to its lowest level on record. It cut eviction filings in half. And this successful advocacy and action is what kept millions of family, families safely housed during the pandemic. 
But now there are tremendous new challenges and renters with the lowest incomes are struggling more than ever. In 2021 and 2022, just as pandemic help ended, steep rent hikes and increased costs across the board squeezed people with low incomes. So those rent increases were affecting tenants nationwide and worsening and deepening the housing crisis. Between January of 2021 and June of 2022, median rents in the US increased by 25%. And at the same time, costs for necessities like food and transportation also increased dramatically, leaving low-income renters with unsustainably tighter budgets and forced to make really difficult trade-offs, sacrificing childcare, medical care, or store-bought store food in order to maintain housing. And even prior to the recent rent hikes, renters were facing the effects of a long-standing trend of rents rising faster than wages. Nationally, between 2001 and 2021, real median rents increased by about 18%, while real median household income increased by only a little over 3%. And increased rents result in increased homelessness. The US Government Accountability Office has found that a $100 increase in median monthly rent is associated with a 9% increase in homelessness, and rents rose by nearly $200 a month in recent years. So indeed, as a direct result of rising rents, homelessness is increasing in many communities throughout the country. And as Steve said, while communities are successfully rehousing individual people every day, they cannot stem the tide of people falling newly into homelessness or who on, are on the cusp due to a lack of homes affordable and available to the lowest income people and woefully inadequate federal funding for solutions. And as effective and as important as emergency rental assistance and temporary eviction protections were to keeping millions of people stably housed during the pandemic, they were only ever a temporary patch to the gaping holes in our social safety net that did not address the deep structural flaws in our country's housing system that perpetually leaves millions of the lowest income people struggling to keep a roof over their head. So now in those communities where renter protections expired and where emergency rental assistance is depleted, eviction filings have reached and in some areas surpassed pre-pandemic levels. And with that, we're seeing that increased level of homelessness. And this brings still more challenges. As homelessness increases and becomes increasingly visible, there has been a dangerous and growing backlash against proven solutions to ending homelessness and against people experiencing homelessness. And this backlash, together with the difficulty of providing quick solutions, is causing leaders of both parties and at all levels to make harmful decisions to address homelessness, often choosing to simply move people out of public view rather than addressing the underlying causes of homelessness. So the bottom line is this, the same long-standing pre-pandemic housing inequities will persist in or out of a pandemic and homelessness will increase unless and until policymakers at all levels enact robust tenant protections and invest in the long-term solutions needed to make homes affordable to the lowest income people. And now I will turn it over to Peggy Bailey at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities to discuss in more depth the short, medium, and long-term solutions. Peggy? Thanks, Diane. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peggy Bailey. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Vice President for Housing and Income Security here at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, so just to pull out some of the threads that Steve and Diane set up, 
you know, first, we want to be clear that homelessness and housing instability is primarily an income problem. It's not that, that you know, obviously there are people that might have a mental health condition or a disability, um, but that isn't the primary cause of homelessness. It just exacerbates their, their, um, the odds that they might experience homelessness. Um, to lean in on some numbers that Diane mentioned, um, so as, as she said, median rents between um, 2001 and 2021 have gone up by 18% to hone in on the last couple of on the last couple of years of that data from 2019 to 2021 um, median rents went up 13% uh, for specifically for renters who were making less than $15,000 a year so to so the renters who are making the least amount of money saw their incomes go up. And it's really interesting as we look at that data, not only uh, uh, for, for, for that population, other, as you move across the income bands, they saw less and less um, increases in their rent uh, in their rent costs. And people making over $75,000 a year and up only saw a 6% increase in their median rent. And remember, across that time, that's uh, overall inflation was about 6%. So really, the people with the lowest incomes have been hit the hardest as rents have gone up. Now, we know in the, in the, first, in the, in the first half of this year, rent increases haven't happened at that same rate, but it's not as if rents have gone down. Rents remain high, even if they're not increasing at astronomical rates. Also a part as important in the data um, in between 2019 and 2021 is that for those, for those folks who are making the least, Black and Latino renters faced even greater rent increases. So what we know is that, uh, so as I said, overall renters making less than $15,000 a year uh, saw their rents increase by about 13, 12 to 13%. Um, Latino renters in that income bracket saw their rents go up 16%, and Black renters saw their uh, rents go up by 15%. So not only are renters at the lowest income uh, levels seeing the, the, their rents go up the most, but, uh, but Black and Latino renters are facing that challenge even um, even more than their their um, than other races. Um, Asian and Pacific Islanders saw their rents go up by about twelve percent. Um, white renters saw theirs go up by eleven percent. Um, uh, and uh, American uh, Native American and Alaska Native people saw their rents uh, not necessarily increase um, by as much. We think about four percent, but we know that. There's data and reporting challenges always with um, with that population, so it's really important. So to lean in on that, it's really important to understand that those that these rent increases were not met with course corresponding increases in income, and so it is our job to figure out the ways that we can close the gaps between incomes and rents. We learned these lessons during the pandemic by having the emergency rental assistance program, the child expanded child tax credit program. Uh, we also had, we also have um, emergency housing vouchers. These interventions helped increase the income for people with the lowest incomes in order to help um, stymie um, evictions and what we're seeing as Steve mentioned, the primary cause of homelessness. But now those interventions and pandemic relief measures have either ended or are ending. Sure, some communities, um, particularly Philadelphia is a great example, have figured out ways to try to continue the, these best practices and continue to support renters, but it's very hard. And it is, and we need to make sure that um, we're doing that, uh, we're making these investments uh, more broadly. So, um, the other piece of the puzzle that is important to lean into when, um, as, as these reports come out is the fact that we do know what works. You know, housing first interventions with housing, 
um, and wraparound support services are the way to end homelessness. The problem has been this lack of resources in um, particularly rental subsidies and the, so, and the services and case management supports that people need uh, to meet, uh, to be able to um, uh, get people housed quickly. Um, as Steve mentioned, we're, we're doing a great job in housing people. And one of the leading examples of that is the uh, HUD vet, uh, Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Program. Uh, between 2009 and, two, and 2022, we've been able to reduce veterans homelessness by more than half. And the reason we've been able to do that is there are there's rental assistance specifically targeted to veterans with the case management wrapped around uh, and wrap around supports that have led to being able to um, decrease homelessness for for this population. So now is the time is, um, is to invest and uh, is to invest in that intervention for people across uh, the homelessness spectrum. And um, and people and and the, and eviction prevention in order to keep people housed and out of the homelessness system. So I'll just end with this: for too long, we've seen housing as a reward and something that people earn that generates wealth for families. And this is the excuse that we've used to not build enough apartment buildings or 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 to discriminate against people of color, um, people with low incomes, people with disabilities and to restrict their housing access to certain neighborhoods or communities. And this is why so much of federal housing focus is focused on those upper income and middle income people. Even the low income housing tax credit, the major source of building affordable housing in this country, doesn't reach the people with the lowest incomes and requires a rental subsidy if it's going to meet the needs of, of people with the lowest incomes. The rental affordability crisis, as we've said repeatedly, is a is a is largely an income problem, an income problem too that isn't in the hands of the people or the tenants that are struggling to afford their rent. It's in the hands of employers and governments. It's 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 our bosses and the government that decide how much people are going to make, and we we're not going to be able to train or skill build our way out of this crisis. So sure, we can say that housing is a human right. But until we put the money behind that sentiment, we'll be asking the same questions. Why are so many people unhoused in the richest country in the world? And what can we do to end homelessness and evictions? Um, the answer to all that is to invest in, in rental assistance and affordable housing. And with that, I, will, uh, I think we'll open it up to Q&A and I'll pass it to my colleague, Nancy Flores. Thank you, Peggy. That's where right. we'll now, our speakers will now take questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can signal by using the question and answer box on Zoom. So I'll just pause for a few moments to allow everyone to signal for questions. And we have our first question from Robbie Sekera with Stateline. The question is, as it pertains to youth homelessness, how have approaches differed from state and local providers as opposed to adult homelessness? Well, I can start with this. This is Steve Berg. Um, I think what youth who are homeless and what older adults who are, or non-youth who are homeless need is the same thing. They need housing and they need the supportive services that help them stabilize in that housing. Uh, Congress has made specific money available to communities to help design a, a, a system to do that that's specifically targeted to youth, because there are a lot of programs in communities that are youth serving programs. And when Congress started this several years ago, those weren't coordinated very well around the issue of homelessness. So I think that, that getting those youth serving programs involved, Congress appears likely to put additional money on the table for those kinds of programs for communities that haven't done that yet. Um, and it's really about coordinating the youth service serving programs in the community to make sure that youth can get housing quickly and then can get the uh, get the uh, the supportive services they need to stay housed once they're in there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. We'll now turn over to our next question from Chrissy Clark at Marketplace. The question is, I live in Los Angeles. Is there anyone on the call who can talk about how the situation in LA compares to the rest of the country in terms of biggest problems and most notable policy approaches at the state, local, or federal level? I guess I can go again. This is Steve Berg again, because we paid a lot of attention to Los Angeles. And, and it's really the kind of thing I was talking about. The, the homeless programs in Los Angeles are very good. They're very well coordinated. They are moving a lot of people every day from homelessness into housing. Um, the problem is in Los Angeles, the the overall housing market is very bad if you're trying to afford a place you don't have much money um, for for years and years lots of people have been moving to Los Angeles supply and demand means rents go up and they're they're as, as in most places there isn't a really uh, coordinated organized system of making sure that people with the lowest incomes have housing to live in so a lot of people are becoming homeless um, every day as well and it's it's more than the number who are moving from from uh, homelessness to housing. And I would just add two things when it comes to the most notable policy approaches uh, to to raise up that that are really interesting in in Los Angeles. One is Los Angeles, the city and county early on recognizing that it, there's a need to integrate health and housing for people experiencing homelessness and being able to use county resources to provide rental assistance and rental subsidies to people, particularly people who were high cost users of the healthcare system. That has been uh, something that is starting to be replicated in other places uh, like in Illinois and Chicago to be able to sh at least hone in on one population to provide rental assistance, given the what the data that Diane shared around the fact that from a federal perspective, only um, one in four potentially eligible households for rental assistance actually receive it due to the lack of funding. The other notable approach in Los Angeles is what the county has funded, and um, Brilliant Corners is one of the implementers of this, when it comes to hiring realtors, the same folks any of us would use to find housing, to help find housing for people experiencing homelessness. This is particularly innovative because in a lot of places where we think housing isn't available, it's often that it's hard to find rental housing at, for everyone. It's hard, you, you know, and, and for people experiencing homelessness to have the time to be able to stand in line and for people with extremely low incomes to do all the things it takes to, um, find a place to rent, being able to pay for housing professionals to do the housing search has been particularly innovative and has allowed LA to, to do a, um, a better job of utilizing um, their local and federal rental assistance. Thank you, Peggy and Steve. So our next question is from Michael Casey at the AP. Can you talk about the use of homeless weeps and whether they have increased since the pandemic, where they are happening and whether they are reducing homelessness or making matters worse. Also, do you have any data on the cost of these efforts compared to providing housing? So I'll jump in first. This is Diane. Hi, Michael. I'm sure my colleagues have um, have things that they'll add as well. But, um, you know, increased homelessness, and especially as homelessness becomes increasingly visible, is increasing public pressure on policymakers to act. And we're seeing, unfortunately, that many of these policymakers, both Democrats and Republicans, react to the pressure by instead of looking to implement longer term solutions to the underlying causes of homelessness, which we've talked about at length today, they're merely trying to move homeless people out of public view. And that does nothing to address or reduce homelessness in the short, medium or long term. 
it wastes time, it wastes money, um, and it doesn't un address in any in any way the underlying challenges of homelessness. And in fact, the opposite is true. Many times the local policy responses to homelessness are actually making it more difficult for people to exit homelessness because they are people who are homeless that were part of a raid and had their temporary um, community disrupted, they lose connection to outreach workers. That connection gets severed and often it has taken weeks or months or longer to build trust and that trust is severed. And the people who are homeless often lose their belongings. They lose important identification documents that they need to get services. They can lose medication. Um, and in, in, in cases of criminalization where if people remain in a park, for example, where there was a raid and a homeless sweep, and they get arrested for that, now there's a criminal record to add to the many barriers that they already have to be able to get long-term housing. So there's no doubt that homeless sweeps make things worse and do nothing to address the underlying um, um, reasons for homelessness. They are simply a way to for policymakers to alleviate some public pressure by, for some short period of time, moving people out of public view. Thank you, Diane. Our next question is from Janine Monk at the Connecticut Mirror. Question is, have any states or localities been particularly successful at reducing homelessness or evictions? If so, what approaches are working? Sure, well, I'll jump in again, this is Diane. Um, thanks, Jenny, for the question. You know, again, going back to emergency rental assistance, there were over 500 emergency rental assistance programs created around the country with Treasury's emergency rental assistance funds. Um, before that, through the CARES Act, there were about 400 emergency rental assistance programs. Some overlap between them, but, you know, throughout the country, there were over 700 programs created from scratch during the pandemic, and that proved definitively that cash assistance in people's pockets to help them pay the rent and absorb a financial shock works in preventing evictions. And we did, at the National Income Housing Coalition, we did um, a lot of research on best practices together with some of our partners on this call and beyond to look specifically at what about program design is most helpful to the lowest income people, the most marginalized communities, um, and can talk and share some of those details with you. But uh, on, the, on the broader scope and, and higher level, it's having that short-term cash assistance to help people absorb a financial shock and bridge the need for cash to stay housed that works so well. Um, there are there are and also a number of communities that have been enacting and implementing new tenant protections. That's another thing that we have been working on and tracking at the National Income Housing Coalition. And since 2021, there have been over 200 new tenant protections put in place in communities across the country. And there are protections such as expunging eviction records or right to counsel or just cause eviction or a source of income discrimination protections or uh, preventing rent gouging. And each of these in different ways help rebalance the power in our housing system that currently tilts so heavily in favor of landlords at the expense of low income renters back into the hands of renters and people experiencing homelessness. And that too, we can share with you a link on our website with a map and a database of all of the new tenant protections um, and emergency rental assistance programs that have been put in place since 2021. And then I might just be teeing up Steve to give more detail because the Alliance is, is one of the keepers of this information. But from an ending homelessness standpoint, 
you know, many communities have effectively ended vet homelessness among veterans. So they've been, while it, that's not to say that someone who is a veteran doesn't become homeless, but if, but that community feels very confident, has the resources to quickly rehouse that person should they become homeless, especially if that person has um, uh, qualifies for supportive housing. Uh, and I don't, Steve, if you have, do you have the latest information on from that perspective? Or should we just follow up with folks and send them? Yeah, if, I, if people are interested in that, they should just follow up because I don't have it like, I'm not looking at it right now, but, uh, but right, I mean, I think the, the, the veterans programs are better funded um, and use the same sort of approaches as the best HUD funded programs, so, but the better funding has made a difference in terms of moving people the, the of the two dynamics I talked about earlier, the one of moving homeless people into housing faster, uh, the VA has more ability to do that. And then the last thing I would mention is it, there are places that have done an excellent job on chronic homelessness. And one in particular that's exciting is the state of Maine just recently, like recently, like last week or the week before, um, committed significant resources to ending, uh, to in, that should put them in good position to be able to end chronic homelessness, which is, uh, as HUD defines it, people are, have to be, or it's people who are repeatedly homeless, homeless for a, or a year or longer have a disability that that group of folks who are the who are often seen as the hardest to house but with housing first strategies that include rental assistance and housing supports we know we can house them and Maine um, has put some resources behind that and if you're interested we can send you a link to the contacts there Our next question is from Jessica Bari, called to mind American Public Media. The question is, is there a model city in the country who is leading solutions for unhoused population or a successful example of housing first? This is Steve Bergian. I, I always like to talk about Houston, Texas in, in this regard. I mean, there are a number of cities we can look at, but, but in terms of how building a system where everyone's working together to move people who are homeless quickly back into housing. Houston has been doing the right things for, for quite a period of time now and continues to do so. Um, in terms of people working together, both people who are sort of working for homeless programs, but also like the healthcare system, like, like Peggy mentioned, uh, the larger housing system. Um, and, and, uh, really getting the elected politicians involved. The, the, a series of mayors in Houston have, have called on, have, have made it their business to get the city organized to do this, including the one who's there now. And really, you know, this really helps with land. A lot of times it's, it's hard to get landlords to say, oh yes, I'm gonna rent to, to people who are homeless, but the, the mayor has been instrumental in making that happen in Houston. So we see Houston was one of the early cities to show a big decline in the number of homeless people because of having a good organized system for moving people quickly from homelessness into housing. More challenged lately as their housing market has gotten more expensive, um, but they're still managing to work on those kind of, uh, those kind of interventions. And our next question is, what are the racial disparities of people experiencing homelessness? Very high. I mean, the, 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 just from, from when, from the first collection of data of the, about this topic, it, it's just been, the, the, the data has shown very clearly that that black people are far more likely than white people to experience homelessness at any given time. Even dating back before any of the national data, um, the, the, it, it was quite apparent to people working in this field that, that this was part of the issue. And it's, it's partly it's just because of 
seg of uh, segregation in housing and discrimination in the housing field. Partly it's because the, 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 the systems that people come out of and become homeless, like the, 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 uh, like prisons, like the child welfare system are systems where, where black people are overrepresented in those systems. Yeah, I would just add to that. Just, oh, go ahead, Peggy. Go ahead. Oh, well, and I, I yeah, just to add to that, I um, not only are Black people overrepresented in the homelessness system, but also, and um, but Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, from what we what we know, at least are are even more overrepresented in the homelessness system. So, um, uh, there, so for every ten thousand people, uh over 120 people uh, who are Native Hawaiian or, or Pacific Islander experience homelessness. For Black people, that number is 46. For American Indian people, it is 40, about 45%. Um, and for, uh, for uh, Latino people, it is, about, it is about 22%. But white people are uh, at 11 and uh, an Asian or Asian American are at 4%. So you can see it's just a huge dispar disparity. And I wanna pull up what I mentioned in my opening remarks around that between 2019 and 2021, we saw rent increases so high for black people and, and Latino people in particular who, with extremely low incomes. So, you know, that, that, that data coupled with what we already know exists in the homelessness system tells, and what Steve said about the causes of homelessness, tell us that that disparity is most likely getting worse. Great, thank you, Peggy and Steve. Diane, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Oh, sure. I know we're, we're over time, but I, I just wanted to say um, to echo what both Steve and Peggy said, but and to add that it is decades of racist housing and transportation policies that created these racial disparities that we have today. We had, for example, deliberate public policy that put home ownership out of reach, purposefully put home ownership out of reach for Black Americans, creating this yawning wealth divide that exists today. And that shows up in our housing system where we see that people of color, disproportionately Black households, are disproportionately likely to be renters, to be extremely low income, to be rent burdened, to face evictions, and to experience homelessness. And so just as it is deliberate public policies that created these disparities that exist today, it will be deliberate anti-racist public policies that can start to repair some of these harms and erase some of these inequities in our housing system. Thanks so much, Diane. And thank you all again so much for joining today and for your questions. So Jasmine, Rashawn, Aaliyah, and Will, um, we have notated your questions and we'll send you responses following the call. If anyone else has any additional questions or would like to um, request an interview with any of our speakers, please do email either me, Tom, or Nancy. And again, we will circle back um, with the remaining Q&A um, questions with responses on those. Um, we appreciate your time. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.